Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Dave Rue. As I, you just heard, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Samsung. Uh, as we all know, healthcare is moving from the hospital to the home. It's moving from sick care to wellness and prevention, and also from provider-centric models to patient-centric models. And central to all of this is the need for us to figure out technology solutions that can allow us to better enable engagement for both the patient and the consumer. So for the next 45 minutes, what I'd like to talk to you a bit about is healthcare innovation with a specific focus on strategies that are designed to engage both patients and consumers in their healthcare. And what I'd like to do is divide my discussion into three parts. First, I want to talk about the changing healthcare environment and specifically the urgent need for us to innovate to create solutions that allow us to be able to understand how the patient and consumer can be better engaged in this process. But at the same time, in addition to the technology, I want to talk a bit about some of the challenges of engaging and keeping patients and consumers motivated uh, when they're on the journey to better health. And a lot of times this does not even involve the technology, but it involves strategies that we'll refer to as behavioral science. The theme for my discussion will essentially focus on this concept called consumerization of healthcare. And I think many of us have heard of this before, but uh, let me just briefly spend a few moments on this. Uh, we are seeing a change in the way that care models are occurring uh, with greater incentives towards individuals, uh, both on the healthcare side as well as the patient side towards better outcomes. We're seeing greater transparency of data, of quality and of cost outcomes, and also a convergence of the different technologies, things that we typically view as healthcare-related, electronic health records and patient portals, with tools that patients can actually go home with and interface with while at home. And so this convergence of consumer-driven technologies with true medical technologies is creating opportunities. And then ultimately, the, the decision or the, uh, the, the, the opportunities for individuals to understand how to stay motivated uh, is something that will allow us to be able to understand how to keep patients on task. So one of the challenges that we face in healthcare today is that, uh, generally speaking, healthcare is something that patients care about because it's front and center, but we don't typically think about it as a consumer unless it's something that's impacting us. But something that does impact us very dearly are our family. And so this is a picture of my uh, daughter. I've got two children. Uh, one is uh, Amelie. She's now at the age of six. At, this, at the time this was taken, uh, she was... Uh, four years old, she had just come back from a birthday party. And I remember at the time, one of the things that we had asked her, because uh, as all parents like to do, you like to quiz your kids. And we had these flashcards. And the word on the flashcard was W-O-O-L. So I asked Amelie, what does W-O-O-L spell? Or, and she goes, oh, that's wool. I was like, oh, great. What does wool mean? And she goes, oh, I know what that is. That's when Nathaniel, and that's her four-year-old brother, pushes me, and I go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Education is particularly important uh, for, all or, for all families, and really what we are finding is that while education is something that's front and center, healthcare tends not to be, but they're intertwined. And if you look at the, the data from the California Department of Finance, uh, you'll see that while budgets remain fixed, the amount of money that can be allocated fluctuates. And so if you look at the different bubbles here, the bubbles that represent the, uh, I guess the pink ones, are the ones that money's being taken away from. And the bubbles that are represented in green represent where all the money's going. So if you look at what's happening in California, and this is a trend that we're seeing nationwide, is that healthcare services are gobbling up all the money. But where's that money coming from? It's coming from the education for our children, our K through 12. And so ultimately, with limited resources, we're finding that this is becoming a major challenge for all families. And we have to find ways to create a greater awareness and more urgency for us to do something about it. And we all know that the US spends way too much in healthcare. It's about 18% of our GDP is spent on healthcare, more than any other country. And it's been predicted by the Congressional Budget Office that by 2015, this year, that we'll be spending more on health care than Social Security. 
So it gives you a sense as to how healthcare is become now not just a smaller issue that we sometimes think about, but is really, really becoming a major economic issue as well. And the challenges that we face is that when you think about all the patients that typically come in and seem to consume the greatest amount of healthcare costs, uh, a large number of it focuses on that group that is um, sort of we'll call it the 5%. And that 5% of patients, which is represented by that second bar graph right, right here, and you can see on the other graph, consumes about 49% of the healthcare costs. So the approach that most organizations have taken to date is, well, if there's only 5%, we can handle that. And so as we think about that, we'll assign people to that group. And so let's call them care managers or population health managers. And these are individuals who we will have track in very, you know, very carefully. They'll call them up and you'll see a lot of um, you know, activity going on, but we'll, we've got this under control. But the challenge is that every year there's a new crop of patients. And in fact, in uh, any particular year, about two thirds of the individuals will be new to that group. So as we start thinking about this, it's not just about identifying that 5%, but it's keeping track of those that are gonna become the next 5% and how do you ultimately expand beyond this? It's about scalability. And as we think about it, our current model is unsustainable. If we continue to rely on human resources without technology or other mechanisms to scale, we don't have the mechanisms in place to be able to create a cost-efficient mechanism to enable our uh, overall improvements in care. So really what we need is we need innovation. And so uh, a quote from a, a gentleman who's a lot smarter than I am, he said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And so really what we're talking about is flipping what we typically know of on the top of its head. So let's think about healthcare today. If you think about healthcare today, and you think about it in terms of a pyramid, at the very top of the pyramid is the hospital, the tertiary care center, where hospitals have the, all the expertise and the resources to do, deliver the best care possible. And ultimately, it's encouraged that patients, as they continue down the journey of not getting well, they will continue to escalate to that point. And what we find is that it's really that top tier of primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care that really ends up becoming healthcare. The patient themselves oftentimes are not considered part of the equation. And in fact, if you ask most physicians, you ask them, uh, you know, what happens after they leave your office? They're like, well, I, I really don't know. You know, it's really unfair for me to be graded or, or you know, penalized based on what happens outside of my hospital or outside of my clinic because I have no visibility into that or no control over that. What if we were to flip that on top of its head? And rather than it being the hospital and the healthcare organizations where we have the greatest amount of attention, what we did is we empowered individuals to be able to take care of themselves. So how do you empower them? Through education, through information, in a way that they understand it. And then you have support mechanisms put in place through family and friends to keep them on task. And then you have individuals that are part of a self-network or self-help network. And then the healthcare organizations come in to facilitate this with uh, perhaps maybe having some of the uh, nurse practitioners, case managers, the individuals who you had originally assigned to managing all their care being facilitators. And at the very bottom of that is the physician. If you flip things around on its head, you've got a very different model of care. And I think this is consistent with what we've heard and seen in other models. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Don Berwick's IHI, uh, the NUCA system that's been well promoted uh, in Alaska. If you look at this from the right-hand side of the graph, and so let me orient you to this graph, because I think it's a very interesting graph and it, and it highlights where we're at today. The x-axis represents the acuity of care. So the, on the far right is our patients who are ill, who require hospital care. The far left are the generally healthy. The, the y-axis represents who's in control of the outcome. And you'll see that the system is typically the healthcare system, and that's represented um, by the lower uh, curve, and the upper curve is the patient and family. So as, if you start from the right-hand side and move from the right to the left, you'll see that at the, on the right-hand side, who has the greatest control of the outcome? It's the physician, it's the system. 
when you're in the hospital, if you control the environment and you, with all your technologies and all the, the tools, you have ultimate control of what happens. But we're moving, as I mentioned, from hospital to clinic to home. And as we make that transition, our ability to have visibility and control over those outcomes as healthcare providers diminishes. And what ends up happening is the pa patient's family and the patient themselves have much greater control. And so as we move to the far right-hand side, you, can, you see what we're talking about. It's really the patient and the family that have ultimate control of the outcomes. As we talk about outcomes delivered, you know, and, and us uh, as healthcare organizations taking control of outcomes, as we move from hospital to outside of the hospital, we need to recognize that it's not always within our control and we need to find ways to engage that critical component, that patient and the family. So how do you get patients engaged? Well, this is a question that many have tr struggled with. And in fact, if you think about sort of the way that some have looked at it, you can stratify patients based on their level of activation or engagement. So I think many of us have heard of the PAM score or patient activation measure score. The PAM score is essentially like 12 or 13 questions that you can ask a patient. These are things like, you know, do you know all your medicines? How comfortable are you, you know, talking to your healthcare provider? Things like that, you know, general questions. And based on your score, you can feel really confident with your, your health care and very um, assertive and very passive on, uh, or alternatively very passive. Now, if you are very confident, and you, you, then you tend to be on the higher, you know, the level three or the four. Now, if you're much more on the passive side saying, well, I, you know, it's out of my control, I just do whatever the doctor says, that's typically level one or two. Across the board, it turns out that there's a, a nice even distribution across level one, two, three, and four on a general population. What we found, though, is if you follow these patients up, this translates directly to the outcomes. And so if you look at patients who are more activated, PAM scores three and four, they tend to have lower 30-day readmissions, lower medical errors, improved care coordination, less health, uh, suffering health consequences, and then greater confidence in their healthcare system. And it, it makes sense because they're probably the ones that are questioning, that are, that are already aware and are, are fully cognizant of the things that need to be done as opposed to those who are more passive or less activated. And what we're finding is that as we want to develop technology solutions that allow you to be able to capture and understand how to optimize patient engagement, we can look at some of the experiences we've had already with mobile applications, for instance. Mobile applications, uh, have, have shown us that certain mobile apps re people respond to well and others they just ignore. What are the ones that they respond to well? Well, if it's seamless, if it's based on, you know, if it creates a great user experience, if it's streamlined with some of their existing tools and workflow systems, if it's been customized, there's some personalization so that it's not just about a one-size-fits-all, but it, it somehow speaks to you and at your level. It's also got to be relevant. It's giving you the right information at the right time and it's got to create that outstanding user experience every single time. And if you're getting that reward and you're feeling that um, opportunity that this is something that provides value, then these are the tools and these are the mobile apps that typically consumers use. These are the same types of solutions and strategies that we can look at as we try to optimize patient engagement. So um, I'm going to share a video that talks a bit more about the importance of communications, then we'll jump back to this discussion. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät, das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. What are you thinking about? <laughs> so communication. Uh, when we think about how we used to communicate, uh, in the 1980s, uh, the advent of the cell phone uh, really started revolutionizing the way that we thought about how we could communicate. Uh, anyone remember the name of this movie? Wall Street, yes. So um, back then it was only the super rich that could carry around these big megaphones. 
Uh, today, everyone carries around a mega, well, I should say a phone, not a smartphone. And what we're finding is that it's because the prices have gone down, it's a lot lighter, greater functionality, um, and there's now greater functionality uh, that go beyond simply the phone features. There's sensors embedded within it. So as we start looking at today, the smartphone has become more than just a mechanism for us to communicate. It's created opportunities for us to capture and create and use tools that we never would have envisioned could have been on something that we carry with us 24-7, or not, maybe not 24-7, but we carry with us at least as we're on the road. So one of those features, uh, I'll just go through some, some examples, uh, fingerprint scanning. You know, we talk about identification and making things easier, putting your finger on it, identify, doing auto authentication. That certainly could improve the user experience. Uh, ability where individuals, let's say uh, in, they're in severe weather, or perhaps even if they've, they're in a nursing home or at home and they're, you're trying to manage them, they fall and they can't get up, push a button, it sends a GPS signal, a uh, pre-specified text alert to an individual and the location that you're at. I mean, this, this is done already for safety, uh, but you can imagine a lot of healthcare uses for this as well. The ability to interconnect with all your different applications and make this one seamless application. The smartphone is becoming the ubiquitous computer that we carry with us all the time. And in fact, if you look at data, these come from Frost and Sullivan, that in 2014, about two-thirds of U.S. cell phone subscribers use smartphones. And it's predicted by the year 2020 that 90% of U.S. cell phone subscribers will use smartphones. In fact, there was a recent study that talked about how homeless folks today, if you were to rank what's the most important thing, their most valuable possession, it's a smartphone. I mean, one, shocking that they even have smartphones. Two, that they would rank it as their number one most important possession. It's the predominant means that we use to, to communicate, and now it's becoming a mechanism for many other things. And so the phone itself has become uh, a very important piece of what we are today. today. But uh, what we're finding is an, as interconnected with the phone is this concept of, of called wearables. And, this, in, and connected to the wearables is this whole explosion of sensors. And so let's just talk a bit more about the wearables and sensors because they are intertwined and ultimately will lead to uh, incredible opportunities as we start exploring adoption strategies. So wearables, typically uh, we think about wearables uh, starting with the wrist, you know, smart watches, for instance, or, or uh, little bracelets that allow us to capture some of the fitness uh, data. But really to keep wearables uh, highly functional, it's got to be interconnected with all the different things we do. Um, so these could be everything from receiving phone calls, getting alerts, calendar invites, email messages. It's got to be simple. It's got to be easy. Uh, there's been a lot of um, attention focused on, you know, the simplicity of pushing a button, but also using voice activation. And then you have to have applications on it that allow you to be able to really take control of your lives, specifically in the area of health and fitness. And so as you think about these, these tend to be some of the most significant aspects of wearables that have led to an explosion in terms of the number of wearables that we're seeing out there. And the wearables now are starting to come in different sizes and designs. Uh, we're starting to recognize that uh, wearables are not just about uh, data, looking at the time. It's not just about capturing fitness, but it's about fashion. It's about comfort. It's about making a statement. It's about connecting uh, seamlessly with your healthcare providers, with your friends, your families, all the different pieces that are on communication. Uh, and then it's about that uh, contextual awareness of all the things that you're doing around fitness. So uh, some examples, uh, some of the, you know, the wearables today have GPS, and um, they can tell you where you're at, not only location-wise, but altitude-wise. You can track your heart rate uh, and, and check the UV sensors, so there's a lot of information that can be gathered from these wearables. Another wearable that we don't oftentimes think about is one that you could actually wear on your head. Now, we've talked about, you know, glasses that uh, many of you are familiar with the glasses, but there's also virtual reality wearables. Uh, so this is a wearable that uh, allows you to be able to, through wearing um, a device that creates a 360-degree immersive experience. There have been some healthcare providers that have used this already for post-traumatic stress disorder and have found that these are mechanisms that create a very, really vivid experience that can, re, that can allow individuals, to, in some individuals, to uh, very slowly transition and gain greater understanding of certain scenarios. So 
a lot of potential innovative use cases around this new type of wearable. And then sensors. Uh, as we think about sensors, sensors don't necessarily have to be on the wrist, doesn't have to be on the phone. We see it everywhere. And ultimately, the interconnectivity of these sensors with your devices that allow for communication will allow us to be able to, at some point, become as smart as your car. I mean, today, we have incredible technologies on our cars that can tell us things like, hey, you need more oil, uh, your, your cars you know, need this much time or mileage before it's the next tune-up. Uh, we need that type of stuff on our bodies and transmitting through our phones and our other technology devices. At some point, we're going to be able to get there, uh, and we're slowly and we're quickly getting there. And what's creating is uh, what I'll call a disruption, because what we're finding is that what used to be considered healthcare and what used to be considered consumer are now intertwining, and that intertwining of fitness and healthcare uh, can best be uh, described in, in in an example that uh, I know is being done at, by the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the Mayo Clinic has been working very closely with us to capture data for patients with cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, these are patients who ultimately have to come into a facility uh, to continue to that rehabilitation process. Many of these individuals are already exercising or doing work outside of that facility. What they are looking to do is figure out a, a way to structure that, that activity outside of those uh, scheduled visits. So connecting the life fitness and, and pre-core uh, machines with uh, data that sends it directly to the phone and ultimately through the wearables sends it directly to the phone stored in a fitness cloud and the healthcare provider can actually gain access to it and be able to manage the overall rehabilitation program. So really looking at consumer driven, consumer tech based technologies, combining it with some of the, 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 the real innovative needs that healthcare professionals see today. And the fitness apps, uh, we see a tremendous explosion of different types of fitness apps out there. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that they also can do many things uh, and they can help motivate and help keep certain individuals on task uh, through uh, coaching mechanisms, et cetera. Ultimately, the, a lot of this information is going to need to be organized. And it's, it's somewhat disparate, but at the same time, it provides a more meaningful picture of one's overall uh, outcomes. And so if you think about, uh, just generally speaking, where we are today, much of our data is based on the medical record. And uh, the medical record will say constitutes 10% of um, what is mostly to impact your overall outcomes. It's all the things that you do outside of the, 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 the clinic visit, outside of the hospital, with your lifestyle, the environment that you live in, even your biology, that can drive a lot of that outcomes. Once we have all that data collected, in fact, we, there are sensors and there's applications that can capture every single one of these things that I've listed here on the data modality. You can then create user interfaces that allow you to be able to create programs that can then uh, interface with both the patient, the consumer, as well as the healthcare provider and provide for meaningful coaching opportunities. So one of the things that uh, you know, we've been looking at uh, are specifically, as you think about digital health and all the opportunities, there are many different what we'll call pillars, areas that we need to focus on. We talked a bit about mobile, we talked about sensors and devices, talked a bit about some of the algorithms and analytics. Um, cloud and big data are obviously very important. But the one area that I want to spend a few moments now talking about is behavioral science. Because this connects it all. This is really the glue that makes it all make sense. So. Uh, Folks at uh, Partners, uh, through their Connected Health System, uh, Organization, Joseph Kevadar, others, have identified that when you take these technologies and sort of put it in the wild and, and look at what actually happens, that it turns out that certain individuals tend to adopt it and use it very well, and others tend not to. So uh, to orient you to this graph, the, the y-axis is the severity of illness. And the x-axis is, is uh, how well you're adopting the new smart device. So those that tend to adopt things, are very eager to adopt it, are on the far right-hand side. Well, it turns out that that group is probably the least sick. So that's why they're in the lower right. And we'll call them either quantifiable selfers, worried well. You know, uh, there's a variety of terms for this, these individuals. And these are folks who, uh, if you give them the device, they will grasp it and they'll want to use it and, and they will, this will be great for them. 
But the group that we oftentimes tend to be more interested in, from at least from a healthcare outcomes perspective and a cost perspective, is that group that's in the upper right-hand side, the ones that are sicker, the ones that are you know, uh, perhaps uh, least likely to adopt those devices. So which throws, throws into question, do we have the right, is, is it the right approach to take technology and throw it at these individuals and expect them to respond? So I'd like to challenge that with some real data. Uh, so there are researchers uh, throughout the country that are looking at this, and, and I'm just gonna give you one example. David Gustafson at the University of Wisconsin spends a lot of his time looking at a very sick population of individuals with chronic diseases, specifically those with alcoholism and drug abuse, who tend to be some of the highest users of the uh, healthcare resources today. And what he wanted to do was to understand in this group of individuals who have, with high comorbidities, high risk, high cost, specifically those that have been hospitalized greater than three times in the past 18 months, could we give a mobile application to encourage them and provide support for them around staying abstinent on alcohol. Sounds like a daunting challenge. And what they were able to find in the randomized control trials that they performed, so not just anecdotal, but randomized control trials, statistically validated that they had lower 30-day abstinence, fewer heavy drinking day, days. So what really resulted in this? There's, and so you know, in terms of looking at the research and actually talking to David, um, we, we concluded that there were three things that seemed to, to be the most significant factors. The first was that they, there wasn't a one-size-fits-all. It was a personalized approach that was uh, allowed individuals to select which modalities would be most effective for them. The second was that they had to have something that they would carry with them all the time. And the mobile phone ended up becoming the perfect choice in this case. And what they received were reminders. And these were reminders that were about, hey, re remember, you know, to stay strong, don't, 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 um, don't fall off the wagon, you know, don't take a drink today, you know, whatever the reminder. It was a customized reminder for each individual. And they got it at periodic times or at per periodic situations. Uh, but in addition to the reminders, there was another piece to it, which was just as important. And it w the piece was around securing that acknowledgement. So once the individual received it, they had to acknowledge that, yes, I agree, I won't do it. And that, that second piece of getting that commitment from the individual to the, the actual process was just as important as them receiving that initial reminder. And lastly, there was a very fascinating component um, around alerting and real-time location services, which I'm gonna talk about shortly, and then the need for social support. So uh, some of you are familiar with geofencing. Uh, but for those that aren't as familiar with geofencing, let me just very simplistically describe it. Uh, in geofencing, you can create, a, we'll call it a fence, a, an arena, a boundary, in which you can identify uh, when an individual is outside of it or when they're inside of it. And once they've arrived inside of that geofence, it, it can create a trigger that will allow you to be able to alert individuals and or send messages and or communicate. And once they leave it, that also creates a trigger. So the way that they used it for in this modality was they had identified that certain bars uh, were high risk areas that once they approached these bars that they would actually get an alert. And as the closer they got to the bar, the, the, the more likely that they would, you know, the, the alert would um, you know, fire more frequently and, more, and be more persistent. And then also uh, there, was a, there was a help button. And then if they, they really needed that help, they could push that help button and they could ultimately get um, you know, contact with someone, either a family, friend, or a healthcare provider that could, that could really help them through this, this uh, crisis. And those two pieces of creating that geofencing that with real-time location services and the ability to create that social support network were critical. So when you look at wh how, why did this intervention work, this graph represents the different types of interventions that were applied. And what you'll find is that if you look at the, um, we'll call it the red line, the red line is what was actually used, and then the blue line is what was perceived to be helpful. And so I've, I've put in boxes the ones that are really the, either really high or fairly high for either the blue or the red. And what ends up being uh, most important are the social aspects, the ability to message, have discussions, the panic button, the, the weekly surveys. 
this constant communication, having that social network, that connectedness, is a very important part of what made this intervention successful. So what we're seeing is that there's a changing evolution in terms of how patients and consumers are gathering and interpreting and receiving information. So what used to be is patients were told what they did, and they did it. And that was expected. It was all about compliance with the medical treatments. Then we started seeing uh, with the internet that patients could access information. And so they be some of them became much more vigilant in this area. And then through social networks and social media, they started finding each other. But what we're finding now is that information is finding the patients. And information is being pushed, and it's contextually aware, and it's something that is very engaging. This is the new future of how information is being exchanged and how patients and consumers are consuming that. So what used to be uh, the physicians and the hospitals saying, get to know us, you know, we're, we're your healthcare provider. The patients are saying, no, get to know me first, and then I can help you get to what you're looking for, which is all of us to get better outcomes. So when you think about this, uh, I know many of you uh, have heard about the $215 million investment in precision medicine, which uh, was very exciting and I think in many ways represents a very step, important step forward. The way that precision medicine was defined is delivering the right treatments at the right time, every time, to the right person. Now the way it has been described and the way it traditionally is thought of is in terms of the area of genomics. Uh, and, and it's absolutely a, a very important part of what is the future. But if you think about the future with precision medicine, highly effective drugs targeted to one's genome, as opposed to the one-size-fits-all, we are actually looking at not just a, an opportunity to apply this in genomics, but really to all of patient care. Can we take this one-size-fits-all approach that we do to patient care and ultimately allow us to understand how we can customize this for individuals? And so as we start segmenting individuals based on their mobile technology and their preferences, we learn a few things. So this data comes from the Blue Cross Blue Shield, where they looked at individuals that have no comorbid conditions, have one comorbid condition, or two or more. And they wanted to understand, is there a difference in the way that they use the internet or the cell phone? And what they found is that almost all of them have cell phones, but not all of them like to receive text. And so, for instance, those who tend to be, uh, you know, without conditions, fairly healthy, they tend to text about 60 percent of the time. Others with more comorbid conditions, other modalities seem to work better. So as we start thinking about these approaches, you know, have we thought about what works best for our patients? And ultimately, it's about motivation and the ability to keep our patients and our consumers better aware and, what need, and, and informed of what needs to be done. So um, how many of you are familiar with the marshmallow test? A show of hands. Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the marshmallow test, it's a test that was devised in the 1960s but really made famous in 1970 by researchers at Stanford University. And what they did is they took children of the age of four to six uh, to understand could they wait? Could they, they knew that they needed, uh, they wanted the marshmallow, but could they wait that 10 minutes before, you know, that, that, that the, the time would go up, and then they would get two marshmallows at the end. And what they found is that the individuals who waited versus the individuals who couldn't wait, who didn't have that ability to, for self-control, had different outcomes. And these outcomes went way beyond the marshmallow. They followed these individuals up for years, and they found that those who couldn't wait, that didn't have that self-control, that didn't have, that, that did, couldn't control their impulses, struggled more in stressful situations, had more trouble paying attention. They couldn't maintain the friendships. They actually did lower on the SAT and had a higher body mass indexes, and they were more likely to be addicted to drugs. So as you think about it, what an incredible opportunity to understand at an early age if there's something that we might be able to do to help individuals uh, in this area. So, as a father, oh, I obviously wanted to test this out on my children. <laughs> so uh, this is Nathaniel. Uh, this is taken when he was four years old. And Nathaniel, uh, I sat him down, and I asked Nathaniel, uh, do you want this marshmallow? And he goes, yes. So I said, OK, sit down here, at the, uh, and here's the, here's the marshmallow, but don't eat it. I'm going I'm to uh, you know, use this clock, and then when it hits this number, 
um, we're, we're gonna, then you can eat it, but don't eat it now. Do you understand? And he said, sure, I understand, or yes. And so he sat there. And so to my excitement, he did not eat the marshmallow. But unfortunately, after one minute, he got up, went to the freezer, grabbed a popsicle, and began playing with his car. <laughs> What works well in the clinical trials doesn't always work well in the real world setting. And we see this all the time because as you think about like wearable devices and, and our excitement with them, we found that only a, about a third of the wearable device owners stopped using them within six months because there's no sustainability. There's no reason for them to want to continue to use it beyond. And there have been many discussions and many analyses looking at that, but really three factors seem to have come about in terms of how you can create long-lasting engagement for individuals. And the first is around habit. And have you created something that is very um, rewarding and consistently rewarding? So I'm not sure how many of you have ever found the scenario where you're waiting in line and you're, you're kind of bored and so you pull out your cell phone and you check your email. So, so why, why do we do that? Well, the, the situational scenario is we're bored. The behavior is checking your email, but the reward is that getting that little you know, nugget of information. And the, every time you do that, it becomes much more addictive. And so we talk about these you know, crack berries, and we talk about the individuals who just can't control themselves. It's because we've created a habit-forming a routine that is something that is very rewarding and provides that self-gratification. The second feature is the social motivation. And the social motivation is around recognizing that it's not just individuals as one person who's out there fighting this disease, but it's people supporting them. And these individuals can share information, they can compete. Uh, we've seen this work with many times where health organizations will create challenges and, and you know, allow for competition. That definitely works. You can learn from others as well. Uh, and then sometimes you can identify new connections through other individuals. And the last one is about goals. Without a goal, it's really hard to know how you're doing. And a lot of patients don't have goals. So if there's a way that you can find not only your goal is to get to this hemoglobin A1C, which is a rather nebulous goal. Let's create some several small goals. Your goal is to check your blood sugar every day, once a day. That's it. That's all we're asking for. And, and, and kind of personalized real-time feedback. And as we start looking at applying some of these strategies to some of the mobile solutions and some of the te technologies that we're looking at today, we're much more likely to create longer-lasting engagement. So I'd like to close with a, a video, and then I'll, I'll have one last slide. So this last video is about the challenges of staying motivated and keeping on task. Might need to increase the volume on this. All hell. Very How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. I'm doing okay. How are you? Okay. I'm, I'm, doing I'm not so good because you were uh, weaving all over the road there. Well, can Sir? we get one thing straight? I have not um, been drinking. We need to, okay. And right hand to the nose. Yeah. With the left hand. All right. And back out. I, I need you to recite the alphabet from Z to A backwards as fast oh, as you can. Can you Z do that for me? Yeah. Sure. Backwards. Uh, Z, Y. X W V U T S R Q P O N M L K J I H G F E D C B A. Remarkable. I've actually never seen anybody do that. <laughs> I'm not worried about your bladder right now. Sure. Okay. Tim. All right. All right, well, you got pretty good balance. Thank you. Uh, I want you to step, bump, step, bump, bump, step, bump, step, bump, bump. Five, six, seven, eight. Step, bump, step, bump, bump, step, bump, step, bump, bump. Out of array, kickball change, step, clap. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. You know what would be good is if you. Get kicked, and then you can get down on the barrel, turn, and then ha! Well, that was good. That would be. That was 
was really good. You a dancer? No. No, no, no. Not a, I'm, I'm just drunk. <laughs> So the concept of consumerization of healthcare, uh, it starts with the idea that data and information can empower patients and consumers to better healthcare. But in order for this to occur, we need to see changes in the way that care delivery is, is occurring with greater incentives to patients and to healthcare individuals, greater transparency of the data, greater transparency of the quality and the cost, and a convergence uh, whereby the technologies are geared towards the workflow of the patient and not necessarily to the physician. It's got to be for both. And so we're looking at ways that we can identify what makes it easier for individual patients. And a lot of times it means using the devices they're most comfortable with, which are the consumer devices. And then lastly, it's recognizing the fact that data by itself does not create long-lasting motivation for the majority of patients. Really what we're looking at is an opportunity to personalize approaches, use mobile and sensor technologies, and be able to create strategies that allow us to be able to have long-lasting, engaging, sustainable approaches. So uh, with that, I'd like to close, and thank you for spending uh, the, the morning with me, and I'll be open up for questions. Thank you very much.